Just yards from the shore of Sabasco Harbor, Maine, sits a small, unassuming island, with its trees towering end to end. You would never know that this was once a small community all of its own. Not only was this island inhabited by Wabanaki people long before, but it later became home to a marginalized, mixed-race community, until one day the government stepped in to help, if that's not a red flag. Racism, eugenics, and capitalism left this little island all alone so suddenly, displacing, if not victimizing, all the people who once lived there. Today, the little island is under the care of Maine Coast Heritage Trust, but its history is one we should really look at deeply. It was officially added to the National Register of Historic Places in September of 2023. My name is Jen, and this is Outcasts and Dissidents, New England's History of Misbehavior, where we talk about the crazy true stories, real renegades, and rebellious countercultures of New England's past. The first thing you see when your boat approaches the small 42-acre Malaga Island is, of course, the trees. After all, Malaga is Algonquin for cedar, and the trees are mostly cedar, fir, hemlock, spruce, and pine. Then you get closer and you see the shell middens, y'all. A shell midden is a pile of discarded clamshells and such that are indicators of past human habitation. Usually, shell middens are associated with indigenous coastal sites, but the people of Malaga's most recent habitation were also known for their shell middens. The middens probably do originate from thousands of years ago, though, or at least hundreds more than the most recent settlement on Malaga. The shell middens on Malaga are remarkable. Even on the overcast day that I went out last summer, they stood out like freshly fallen snow as the boat made its approach. Malaga's middens are washing away rapidly with rising waters and intensifying storms of today, but... If they could tell stories, they would tell the tales of poverty, injustice, hardship, and dogged determination. They would tell of the day the man came, and the island fell silent and still. They would tell of bodies lifted from the grave. These middens are the only sign left of what the island used to be. Home. Early Phippsburg settler Eli Perry bought Malaga in 1818 for $150. To our knowledge, he is the first white owner of the island, but he doesn't seem to have paid taxes on it, so. Some sources say that in 1847, Isaac Darling, the son of a liberated enslaved man, Benjamin Darling, sold their nearby home of Horse Island, aka Harbor Island, and moved to the then-vacant Malaga Island. As legend has it, Benjamin was enslaved by a Captain Darling, whom he saved in a shipwreck, earning his freedom. According to a Bowdoin Magazine e-article from Bowdoin College, a fair and upright citizen, he was a reliable worker at the local salt mill. He was mauled by a bear while trying to defend his neighbor's corn patch. Eventually, he bought his own island, Horse Island, Check out the article in the annotated bibliography down yonder. But also, this is not the first story of a possibly formerly enslaved man going toe-to-toe with a bear in Maine. This is, is this a historical topic for me to become the foremost authority on? And it might have to be because I do love History Obscura. But anyway, why Isaac would have moved to Malaga is anyone's guess. And maybe he didn't, who knows? It may well have been another island as the Darlings moved to quite a few of the nearby Casco Bay Islands. Records are pretty scarce at that time and sources disagree, so check them out below and sort through all of that confusion for yourself. Another first possible resident of Malaga might have been Henry Griffin, Griffin, along with members of the Darling family, including his wife, who actually was Benjamin's granddaughter. Fatima Darling Griffin during the Civil War era. By the end of Reconstruction through the 1870s, the island had a population of 27. 
Some of them moved to Malaga from other nearby islands, as that whole little Casco Bay area between Harpswell and Sabasco is just chock full of inhabitable islands. According to the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, longtime Malaga family surnames included Murphy, Griffin, Dunning, Johnson, Eason, Marks, McKinney, and Darling. And then later on, the Tripps and the Parker families arrived as well, too. Not all of these families on this small, historically black island were black, though. For example, James McKinney, known as the King of Malaga, uh, he was a literate Scots-Irishman raised in Phippsburg. He married Salome, a black woman of Malaga, and together they started a family on the island. Later, they welcomed a school into their home. According to McKinney, in a 1911 newspaper article with the Lewiston Evening Journal, there was no family left on the island that was not mixed race. As a result, controversy swirled around Malaga, thanks in no small part to those busy-bodied newspaper reporters. Despite common misconception, I've said it before and I'll say it again, New Englanders, by and large, were not anti-racist, abolitionist, social justice warriors, or any such thing. If clickbait had been a thing, circa 1900 Southern Maine news, a lot of the taglines would have had something to do with Malaga and other such islands or communities. In addition to black and white settlers, the island had a population of Penobscots in the community too. Having black, white, and Penobscot people living together and intermarrying on an island so near you could watch them go about their day to day was absolute fodder for the media, especially in a time where what will the tourists think of us it was just becoming a concern. According to Maine Coast Heritage Trust, which I'm just going to call MCHT for now on because it's too much, uh, rumor mongers, this is a quote, rumor mongers and reporters created fictionalized accounts of Malaga's community, depicting residents as escaped southern slaves or the offspring of slaves and describing islanders as immoral, lazy, shift shiftless, ignorant, and alcoholic. An August 1905 edition of the Casco Bay Breeze newspaper dubbed the island Malaga, the home of southern Negro blood, incongruous scenes on a spot of natural beauty in the Casco Bay. End quote. Bowdoin College's article cites a 1902 article from the Bath Enterprise saying similarly, quote, no worse heathenism we imagine could be found in far off heathen countries as can be found on this godless island. End quote. At the time, much such interracial marriage was actually technically illegal and certainly socially unacceptable. So the moral calamity and impoverished eyesore of Malaga could have had major adverse economic impacts they feared. I also remember hearing and or reading somewhere that people believed that the people of Malaga were having demon babies, or at least babies with horns and tails, which sounds perfectly likely 1800s dramatizations. These Victorians were profoundly fear mongers and dramatic fanatics of the supernatural as much as I do love them. Kind of take what they say with a grain of salt when it comes to these things, because they really love to play up the fanatical and over-the-top, dramatic, supernatural, crazy, wild <laughs> stories of, I mean, demon babies and ghosts and whatever, vampires. Mulligan's community was pretty self-sufficient, despite its close proximity to shore. This allowed the island to hold its own pretty well and live unconventionally, although by no means in the lap of luxury. By 1900, the island had grown to 40 inhabitants. Although they were reputed to be lazy and whatever, residents provided for themselves with fishing, digging clams, and growing corn, beans, and potatoes. Many of the inhabitants made their livelihood on marine resources they kept as sustenance or sold on the mainland. In the previously mentioned Lewiston Evening Journal article, the reporter makes it a point to say that what Malaga had were dogs, D-A-W-G-S, not dogs, D-O-G-S. I guess that's mongrels or mutts or whatever. Uh, 
your standard run-of-the-mill shelter dog by today's standards, most likely. Uh, they also had chickens, but no livestock. It was a fairly cheap and simple life, early minimalist, you could say. But the reporter described the conditions of the homes, that they were essentially built but never repaired. If a window broke, it was stuffed with fabric or whatever to keep out the draft. It was true destitution in many ways, and certainly a hard life to live with or without racism as a factor. It was poverty by all means, but archaeological digs have turned up evidence that they had many of the commodities like medicine, razors, some lovely pottery, and certainly delicately buttoned clothes. You can find a YouTube video from the Main State Museum showing footage of their centennial exhibit on finds from Malaga and a talk given by Malaga descendant Laura Harrison down below. The Puppers Relief Fund started helping the community in 1892, mainly in the winter. If you're from New England, you know or can imagine that it's zero fun being out on a boat in the ocean in the winter, so these folks hardly could have made a dime much of the year. Unfortunately, receiving the funds drew even more negative attention. Massachusetts missionary missionaries George Lucy and daughter Cora Lane started a school on Malaga in 1906 in the home of the McKinneys. Their summer home was just a dinghy ride away on Harbor Island, formerly Horse Island. According to MCHT, quote, the Lane supporters believe that Malaga's future lay with its ch children and that education would allow them to better assimilate into a changing world. That assimilate word, where do I know that from? And a real quick break for some modern day interests. I'm punny. Today, I present Worthy Bonds, an easy way to save and invest that earns you 7% APY interest, starting with as little as $10. When you join using the referral link with as little as that crispy $10 bill, we both will get $10 in free bonds. Pretty sweet, right? So kindly tap it to get started. My suggestion is also set a purchase rounding up so you can invest your spare change without even thinking about it. Check out their calculator through my link and see what your money will grow to when it starts compounding because you are worthy of saving. The island then got a proper little schoolhouse that was said to be a better school than those on the mainland, probably due to being privately funded as a result of the philanthropic movement. Children from the mainland even came by boat to Malaga to go to school. Children had a full curriculum in their little one-room schoolhouse, learning about reading and writing, art and music, geography, history, math, and even home ec. It was painted red, fully equipped with and 360 square feet with a flagpole outside and all. Behind the school, the teacher had a little cottage to live in. There could have been hope that the school would, in time, improve conditions on the island generationally. There was evidence that the children were already beginning to be positively influenced to aspire to more than the hard-knock islander fishing lifestyle, if not persuaded into shame about their life and their family and probably themselves as well. Not only did they have a subsistence lifestyle and a school, but resident John Eason also served as a preacher when weather made boat travel unfriendly. He was a carpenter and a master mason. The island is still scarred with hand dug wells and both lilacs near where homes once stood, but there is little to no trace of the homes remaining. Disputes over who was responsible for Malaga had been pretty relentless, and de disputes were all over the place. Disruption to their lives officially came when the government paid a visit on July 11, 1911. Spoiler anytime the government shows up at your doorstep and says, I'm here to help, would you mind showing me around? Don't trust them. The truly shameful thing about it is that they were not told that the government was coming. They wanted the island to be as usual. If anyone had time to clean up, it wouldn't be so obvious how much help they really needed. I don't actually think it was malicious on part of the Good Samaritans. It was just naive AF. The secret intent was to create 
a tourist resort on the island as all of this was happening during the tourism revolution if Maine's economy. I might get into the tour tourism revolution someday, but in short, we had tapped out a tremendous portion of our natural resources, the railroad was making its way up here, and the class divides were narrowing. The Industrial Revolution and modern economic structure were creating a middle class, which was more vacationers and more people in general, and we needed their money. Maine's governor, Frederick Plystead, visited Malaga with a whole troop of other officials in tow. MCHT says it pretty magnificently. Quote, the governor lauded Malaga's new school, where students serenaded him with a hymn and later reported to the Brunswick record that the people cannot be forced to leave their poor homes. Yet, after the governor and his entourage toured the island, the state announced that the heirs of Eli Perry owned Malaga Island, although later research found no deed confirming their ownership. Within three weeks of the governor's visit, the Perrys issued eviction orders to the Malagites, which then was thought of as a slur, uh, who inhabited the island for more than half a century, demanding they vacate the island by July 1st, 1912. That's sure gross, right? Don't worry, let's also rewind. <laughs> In 1911, Plysted also institutionalized some of Malaga's residents after the visit, who would have fit whatever profile for being inferior according to eugenics. You know, that thing Hitler used to justify genocide. Malaga's community was assessed based on the composition of their individual households, racially that means, and each person's physical, mental, and financial state. Reports vary, but eight or ten of these residents were committed to the main school slash home for the feeble-minded in New Gloucester, now called Pineland, which will be, drumroll please, the next topic of our next episode. Most of the Marx family suffered this fate, and I do believe that they were mostly Black and Penobscot. There were about 45 people left on the island at that point that had to vacate. Laura Harrison tells MSM and a group of kids the story of her family's experience trying to find somewhere to relocate along the New Meadows River. Her mother's grandmother fell sick, and her husband had to leave her to find help. He left the children with her, and she died. When he returned, she says... The children were clutching their mother's dead body, trying to keep her from rolling into the sea and crying. You can hear her whole talk in the video and the sources below. It's absolutely moving. Another descendant, Marnie Darling Voter, a fascinating person herself, was told to shut the fuck up and never mention it again when she found out about Malaga and asked her father. Those who were forced off the island were ashamed and afraid of who they were and where they came from. It was a mark they didn't want anyone to know they bore. Oh, Plysted also ordered that the homes left after the eviction be burned. However, the majority of the community that left took their homes with them, either disassembling them to move them to shore or to other islands, or perhaps putting them whole on rafts. Generally, their homes were quite small by our standards. When the man went back in July of 1912 to take away any remaining citizens, Nobody had remained. The school was still there, though, and was moved to Louds Island, where it still is today, if you would ever like to check that out. The state purchased the island for under $500 and exhumed 18 bodies from Mulligan Cemetery in 1912. In a final act of irreverence, as MCHT puts it, the remains were relocated to the cemetery at Pineland, that's right, the home for the feeble-minded. Of course, others were buried there now, too. Those buried at Pineland Cemetery are first the exhumed, Elizabeth Darling, three Easton children we don't know the names of from the plot map, possibly infants, Ellen Griffin, George Griffin, Harry Griffin, Henry Griffin, Roxana Griffin, Rufus Griffin, Timmy Griffin, two little ones of Henry Griffin we also don't have names for on the plot map, Lucy Griffin Johnson, Hannah Marks, Harold Murphy, Calvin Tripp, and Laura Tripp. The others, including five members of the Marks family, are Jake Marks, January twelfth or January nineteen twelve, James Marks, May twenty fifth, nineteen twelve. So they did not make it long after they got to Pineland. 
Lizzie Marks, December 15, 1921. Ella Marks, January 26, 1925. William A. Marks, April 13, 1928. And two others, Annie Parker, May 30, 1925. And William Gomez, November 17, 1919. One woman, I believe, was actually released or relocated um, and talks about her experience. I wish I could find that uh, account still. In 2017, a large memorial was erected at Pylon Cemetery to commemorate the people of Malaga and the persecution that they faced by the people on the mainland and the main government. It reads, from, 18, this, from the 1860s until 1912, a community of laborers and fishermen lived on Malaga Island off the coast of Phippsburg. A controversial community for its time, white and black residents married and lived together on the small island until the state of Maine evicted them in 1912. Included in the eviction was the state's removal of the island cemetery to the grounds of Maine School for the Feeble-Minded, where some island residents were committed. Remembered here are the community members exhumed from the Malaga Island Cemetery by the state and those who died here as patients. It should probably not come as a surprise that they never made a resort. The state sold the island in 1913 and has sat vacant ever since. In 2001, Mako's Heritage Trust got a hold of it and has done a great job preserving it and making it accessible to the public and descendants of Malaga's former community. Camping is not allowed on the island by the public, but it is allowed for the descendants if you talk to MCHT. They also make it a point to include the descendants in major decisions to ensure they have a voice, recognizing them as stakeholders. The first reconnaissance archaeological survey was in 18, yeah, 1989. Uh, in, those, in those and subsequent digs, archaeologists have found over 50,000 artifacts dating back from a thousand years ago to just over a hundred years ago when the settlement was abandoned in 1911-1912. Primarily, the site has been explored by the University of Southern Maine, USM. USM's Summer Archaeology F Field School has done annual surveys since 2002 in 2006, they began excavating a few test pits, and the stories of the Malaga community is now becoming a clearer picture for archaeologists, historians, and descendants alike. Hopefully, the public at large will also begin to understand Maine's history better through Malaga's stories, thanks to these USM researchers and other historians. Finds include bone, pottery, tobacco pipes, nails, fish hooks, and coins. Surprisingly, they've also found leather, it always amazes me when his historic leather like this can be found. So I once found a piece of a bridle going back to around the same era and absolutely covered that thing. Researchers have been able to find the former home sites and wells and the location of the old schoolhouse now on Louds Island is also known. Throughout the island, there are markers and there is an entry station where you can pick up brochures and maps and that will tell you what was where if you go around the island yourself, the little like numbered markers. Um, you can arrange a tour through MCHT or you can go by yourself and just use the information that's there. According to MCHT, Malaga Island is noteworthy in archaeological and environmental history because it contains specific household sites that can be matched to individual African Americans for a specific time period. This is a cluster of diversity from long ago that has since been largely undisturbed. Maine lacks locations like this, and yet we should be grateful that we don't have more of them. The event was traumatic, tasteless, and frankly a hate crime. But we didn't go away, Laura Harrison assures us. Her family is large and growing. They are teachers, nurses, and musicians. And they still live in Maine, even though they were isolated, outcast, and persecuted against. Her hope is that by knowing the story of Malaga, people will take a stand to defend people who are being hurt or subjugated by other people. Life on Malaga was difficult, but not violent, as far as we know. The fate some of the community suffered was absolutely abhorrent as a result of the undignified and hateful government intervention. 
trigger warning now, there will be torture and abuse in the next episode when we get into the main school slash home for the feeble-minded. This is, after all, kind of a two-part story, although each can also stand alone this time. Reference the Comstock Mutiny two-part series, Evil for Evil's Sake, that doesn't stand alone so well. My hope is that this episode would help to do two things. One, illustrate that New England is not exempt from systemic racism and two, show the innocuous lives of people who are sometimes sent to these asylums and other places like the Home for the People Minded before we actually get deeply into that story next time. There will be more where this came from because history is just remarkable, friends. The author of Bowdoin College's article quotes a descendant she interviewed saying, My dad was a very angry man, angry at white people because there was nothing in Maine but white people. She tells me over the phone, the author, I don't think Maine has a special love for blacks or anyone else who is not of the white race. They never have, and they probably never will, end quote. She later goes on to say, quote, Maine has silenced and then shamed those with another story to tell, end quote. Ouch, but it's the truth, as much as I love my state. I do hope that does change as we take ownership and accountability for our history of systemic racism and social injustice. Down under, you will find an annotated bibliography with this and the other sources used for research in the making of this episode, as always. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a book on the island. If there is one and I missed it, send me a comment below somewhere, let me know. Be sure to give me five stars, like, follow, whatever it takes to make me New England famous, and be sure you don't miss out on more to come. My Patreon subscribers deserve a huge thank you and shout out because they're helping to cover the cost of doing this thing, which isn't free, you know. So show me some love because I definitely love you. Until next time, I'll be wishing you fair winds, following seas, and social justice. I'm sorry, what?